Okay, we're holding in the period before Tisha B'Av, the three weeks and the nine days, and we're trying to prepare ourselves for Tisha B'Av, and it's very difficult for us to feel the morning of Tisha B'Av, right? And I heard a story which brings out, you know, why it's so difficult for us. There we go. Right? You know, the story used to be very common Jewish practice, something called Tikkun Chatzot. You know what Tikkun Chatzot is, right? Jews would get up in the middle of the night, take off their shoes, sit on the floor, and cry bitter tears for the base of Mikdash, right? So the story goes about a Hasidic master who used to dress like a peasant and travel around the countryside uh, incognito to see how people live. And he comes to an inn, and he spends the night in the inn. The innkeeper didn't know he was a great Hasidic master. He's always a regular guy, right, right? In the middle of the night, he gets out of his bed, takes off his shoes, sits on the floor, is crying bitter tears. The innkeeper's in the next room with his mad wife. He's crying? What's something? Something must have happened. He comes, what's the matter? Why are you crying? I'm crying over the destruction of our temple in Jerusalem. I'm asking Hashem to bring the Mashiach because that guy's back to Israel. That's what you're crying about. Pipe down, you're disturbing the neighbors, right? He goes back and tells his wife. Comes back five minutes later. My wife would like to know, if Mashiach takes us to Israel, can we take our chickens with us? <laughs> uh, chickens, I don't know. Doesn't say anything about chickens. I have to leave your chickens here. Goes back and tells his wife. Comes back and says, my wife said, don't pray for Mashiach to come. We don't want to go to Israel. We want to stay here in Ukraine with our chickens, right? <laughs> So he said, are you crazy? You know, in Ukraine, the, serious, uh, the situation is so precarious. Any minute the Cossacks can come, they can take your chickens, take your wife, take your money, they can kill you. Aren't you better off in Israel with Mashiach? Thinks about it, sounds good. Goes back and tells his wife. Five minutes later, goes back, my wife said, you should pray that Mashiach should come and take the Cossacks to Israel, right? And we'll stay here with our chickens, right? <laughs> That's our attitude. Take the Cossacks to Israel, right? Make Mashiach come, but not during the Rose Bowl, right, 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 right. No, what would you say in the middle of our kindness and Mashi- on Tisha B'Av, uh, someone says, you know, God heard our prayers, Mashiach's coming tomorrow. Oh no, I have my, my plans for the summer vacation, right? Let him come in Elul. <laughs> We're not ready for him yet. So my students often ask me, what is there to cry about on Tisha B'Av? I don't know what there is to cry about. You know, once in America years ago, they would say, we have a state of Israel, why do I have to cry anymore? I don't think anybody asks that question anymore, you know. We have intifadas, we have uh, people dying every day with, with terrorist attacks, right, right? We're not there yet. It's not Mashiach yet. But what is it to cry about on Tisha B'Av? So it reminds me of the story by the liberation of the Kotel in 1967. You know, the battle for the Kotel was a, the battle of Jerusalem was a very bloody battle. There was no air cover. You know, they were afraid they might bomb the, the, you know, the mosque or the churches, right, right? And there were a lot of casualties. And they finally got to the wall. No Jew had been at the wall from 19... 19- 48 to 1967, almost 20 years. And the soldiers burst out in tears. You saw pictures of it, right? The story goes, there were two left-wing kibbutzniks soldiers who were there also. They were atheists. And they were wondering, why are they crying about a wall? Why is there a cry about a wall? I know it has, you know, historical importance. Did you ever hear anybody cry by the Great Wall of China? Nobody cries by the Great Wall of China, right, 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 right. Finally, one of them burst out in tears. He says, what are you crying about? He says, I'm crying over the fact that I'm not crying. Why do I not know what there is to cry about? Why didn't they teach me what there is to cry about this wall, right? I'm crying, but I don't cry. I'm not crying, right, right? So I tell my students, if you don't know what there is to cry about on Tisha B'Av, cry over the fact that you don't know what there is to cry about on Tisha B'Av. That's a good reason to cry. That's a good reason to cry. It says in the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, it is fitting for all who fear God to cry and lament about the temple being destroyed. And the um, Chalushi Arim asked a question, why is it only fitting for those who fear God, right? Those who fear God should wear tefillin. Those who fear God should be Shabbos, right? Everybody's got to do it, right? Someone who, don't, someone who doesn't fear God doesn't think he's lacking anything. There's no Mashiach. Everything good. What do we need Shriach for? Right, 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 right. What do we have a temple for? What is it for? So what should he cry over? The fact that he doesn't fear God. That's a good reason to cry. <laughs> right, 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 right. Famous story about Napoleon Bonaparte conquered a city on Tisha B'Av. He's walking through the city. He sees a synagogue. Goes inside. Everybody's sitting on the floor crying, right? Another down the street, another synagogue, same thing, same thing. What are they crying about? Your Highness, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Temple in Jerusalem? I read the newspapers. There's no temple in Jerusalem. What are you talking about? No, Your Highness, 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, you're still crying about it today, right? And Napoleon Bonaparte supposedly made the observation that a nation that could cry for their temple for 2,000 years, this nation will last forever and eventually rebuild their temple. Right? That's what keeps us going. The very fact that we never forget. We don't want to get used to our situation. You can get used to any situation. A blind man gets used to being blind. He doesn't really appreciate the fact that he's missing the pleasure of seeing a sunset, of seeing a rainbow. He doesn't have that. He doesn't realize he's missing that. A crippled person gets used to it. You can be in, in Siberia and get used to it. You can be in the concentration camp and think that's normal, right? 
We, three weeks a year, we remind us of that. It's not normal. It's not normal not to have a base of maintenance. It's not normal to be able to, not to bring sacrifice. It's not normal. That's not, we don't want to get used to the situation. And the reason why it's so hard for us to appreciate this is because we were all born in Siberia. What do I mean by that? All born in Siberia. Imagine you got someone from New York City. He's used to the nightlife in New York, right? Comes to the Soviet Union. They arrest him. They send him to, to Siberia. What you, what's life like in Siberia? Get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Eat some hard bread and chop wood all day, right? So he misses the nightlife in New York, right? Imagine this guy gets married in Siberia, has a son. The son grows up in Siberia, gets up 5 o'clock in the morning, eats some hard bread, chiefs, chops wood all day. That's what he's used to. He doesn't know what he's missing. He, he never saw New York. We were all born in a world where there's no base on Mikdash. See, we don't even know what we're missing. So in order to have an appreciation of Tisha B'av, we have to learn a little bit about what we were missing. The first thing we have to know is, when we had a base on Mikdash, God's presence was manifest in this world. There could be no atheist in the world when we had a base on Mikdash. Idolaters, yes, believe in many gods. And an atheist, no god, you saw open miracles in the temple. There are letters that exist from Roman soldiers who were stationed in the second temple. You know, the second temple was much less than the first temple, right? It says in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, when they built the second temple, right? So the younger generation was rejoicing. Thank God we're building a temple. The old generation was saying, who remember the first temple? You call that a temple, right? right, right, right. Like the yeshiva, you know, we're happy we have yeshivas today. People are studying Torah, right? But those who remember the yeshivas in Europe before the war, they say, you call that a yeshiva? Right, 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 right. I don't remember that. that old. I'm not that old, right? But I still remember 40 years ago when I came to Israel, right? Studying yeshiva here in 1969. The American students who came in those days date a minimum of two years. No one could afford the tickets, right? The Europeans went home for Pesach, and the Americans stayed for two years. Telephone calls are very expensive, right? Once a year, I called my parents. That was my Hanukkah present, right, right, right? We sent aerograms, right, right, right? And today, you know, and we really learned. Then we really learned. Today, someone comes from America to study here. Two weeks later, his parents come, take him for a tour for a week. Then he goes home for his wife's his sister's wedding. Then he comes back, goes back to Pesach, comes back, calls home every night. Right, right, right. It's not the same. The second temple was much less than the first temple. But the soldiers that were stationed in the second temple, right, and there's still letters existing, letters still exist. When you came into the temple complex, it was like being in a different world. When you saw the Kohen God on Yom Kippur, it was like seeing an angel, right? And it's gone. And it's gone. Right? You know, there's a place called Nebel Musa, Moshe's Mountain, right? In the desert, where they, they claim that's where Mount Sinai was, where Moshe is buried. There's a, there's a monastery there, Santa Cantarina, some pictures of it once. There's a, there's a uh, mosque there, no synagogue. Who says that's the place? <laughs> but even if that is the place, right? But for Jews, that's not special anymore. The Shechina left Mount Sinai and went on the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and 40 years in the desert. Then we set it up in Israel, in Nov, in Givon, in Beit El, and finally, David brought the ark to Jerusalem, and Solomon built the first temple. That's Sinai, that's here, right, right, right? What do we have today? We have the Kotel. I compare the Kotel to a bottle of perfume. Take a bottle of perfume and spill out all the perfume, right, right? Now smell the bottle. It smells good? Still a couple of drops left, right, right? That's a Kotel. We had all the spirituality and it's gone. But there's still a few drops left. You can still feel the Shechina at, at Mount Sinai. The entire Jewish people became prophets. At the splitting of the Red Sea, when a maidservant saw at the Red Sea, Ezekiel the prophet didn't see. If you don't know who Ezekiel the prophet was, he's the one that says, I, the heavens opened up, I saw God sitting on the throne. That was Ezekiel the prophet, right? And that closeness to Hashem, that clarity, we can still have a little bit of the Kotel, right? We're crying about the fact that God's presence is left the world. That's what we're crying about. The prophets told them the, the temple's going to be destroyed. We have Isaiah, we have Jeremiah, we have Ezekiel. The people didn't believe it. They said, Hey Chal Hashem, Hey Chal Hashem, it's God's sanctuary. And the Pasuk concludes, Hey Chal Hashem, Hey Mo, they're God's sanctuary, right? If the Kohen Gadol went into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur and he lost his attention one minute, what happened? Dies. He dies, right? They would tie a rope around him just in case he died to, pull, to get him out, to pull him out, right? Imagine how he felt tying the rope around him, right? Now we know the first temple, they were all very righteous high priests. On the second temple, they were under Roman dominion and they would buy the position from the Roman governor, the highest bidder. And these calling came in there. They would, every year they would die in your Kippur, right? Imagine they're paying so much money to be to the honor of being Kohen Gadol, even though they knew they were going to die, right, right, right? So if the Kohen Gadol died on your Kippur, how could the Goyim come into our temple? It's not possible. Hechel Hashemi, right? 
But the answer to the prophet says, hey, Hashem, hey, well, they're supposed to be the hey, Hashem. It wasn't the Romans that destroyed the temple. It wasn't the Babylonians that destroyed the temple. It was the Jews that destroyed the temple, right? We say in Deuteronomy that we have a mitzvah that when you come into the land, take the idols and destroy them, the altars to the idols, and shatter them, right? Don't do so to the Lord your God. Now, why does the Torah have to tell a Jew not to destroy God's temple? Who's going to destroy God's temple? The answer is, we destroyed God's temple by doing our sins. We caused God's presence to leave. All they destroyed was a building of wooden stone. Right, right? The rabbis say, they ground mill. They ground flour. What does it mean they ground flour? Right? You take a mill, you put wheat in, you get flour. Right, right? What if you put flour in the mill? <laughs> yeah, you're in the cavity. It was already ground. They destroyed a building that was already destroyed. Right? The Jews, through their sins, caused God's presence to leave. And all that was left was a building of wooden stone. So what was the... You know, we have to think of the sins that caused the temple to be destroyed and be able to rectify them. Otherwise, I mean, how are we going to expect the temple to be rebuilt if we're doing the same sins they did that caused it to be destroyed, right? So one place that the rabbis say, the first temple had the three cardinal sins, idolatry, immorality, and murder. Second temple, there was Torah and service, avodah, and yemilis, chasodim, kind deeds. Why was the second temple destroyed? And the Talmud says, because of sinat chinam, hatred, for no reason. I hate you! Why? No reason. <laughs> what does that mean, hate you for no reason? What does that mean? Right, right, right. My Rebbe said, we find the expression chinam in the Torah in one place. It says, we remember Hadaga, the fish that we ate in Egypt, chinam, for free. We ate fish in Egypt for free. I gave us free fish. And the rabbi said, they didn't even give them straw to build the pyramids, the, 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 the bricks. They gave them fish. So they, the women drew water, they found fish in their fish. But the rabbi said, what does that mean, chinam, free? It means free from the mitzvahs. In Egypt, you found a piece of fish, you put it in your mouth and you ate it. Is it kosher? Is it not kosher? What's the bracha? What's the after bracha? <laughs> now we got so many mitzvahs. We're free from the mitzvahs. And they say, you know, we, we don't find Lashon Haru Chinam, we don't find Kinas Chinam, only Sinas Chinam. When you hate someone, you're free from the mitzvahs as far as that guy is concerned. That guy? It's a mitzvah to say Lashon Haru about that guy. So the mitzvahs do bad to that guy. You think so, right? <laughs> you know, right? Sinas Chinam, when you hate someone, you're free of the mitzvahs. That's what you think, right? You really aren't. That's what you think, right? And the Talmud gives an example of Sinas Chinam in the times of the Second Temple. The Talmud says because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa was Jerusalem destroyed. What was the story? There was a man in Jerusalem, a rich man. He made a wedding for his son. And he had a best friend named Kamsa and a worst enemy named Bar Kamsa. And he sent his servant to invite Kamsa. And by mistake, he invited Bar Kamsa. This guy gets invited to his worst enemy's wedding. He says he probably wants to make up. He dresses up nicely. He comes to the wedding. He's eating the food. Then the host comes around shaking out his hand with a video camera. <laughs> he sees his worst enemy. What are you doing here? I was invited. Get out of here. He says, don't throw me out. Don't embarrass me. I'll pay for whatever I eat. Get out of here. I'll pay for half your feast. Get out of here. I'll pay for the entire feast. What a jerk. I got all my all feast paid for, right? And he threw him out. And the rabbis were sitting there. They didn't do anything, right? Because they knew. It's just an example of how rampant the hatred was. That, that they knew if they sat there, it wouldn't, wouldn't help anyway, right? But this guy, Bar Kamsa, was very upset with the rabbis and decided he's going to be a traitor. And he went to Rome. And he told the emperor, the Jews are rebelling against you. He says, prove it. Send them a sacrifice and see if they offer it. You'll see. So the king sent a sacrifice. You know, the Roman kings would send sacrifices to our temple. Our temple is for all mankind, right? Basically, right? King Solomon, when he built the temple, he said a special prayer that if a non-Jew comes to Jerusalem to our temple and makes a request, it should be granted. If a Jew asks God for something and he's not granted, he doesn't give it, so he feels, okay, he said no, right? But if a non-Jew comes, he's not answer, he'll say there's nothing to it, right? They say even today, even today, when non-Jews come to the hotel, they always get their prayers answered, right? There was a lady who came, she was in a hotel room, she didn't have a nice room, she would complain, she had a new room, there were no rooms ready. She went to the hotel, they put a note in, she put a note on, she got another room, she got back, ready to another room, right? <laughs> this lady from in Borough Park was coming to Israel, so she had a non-Jewish co-worker in her office, and she said, you go to Israel? Put a note for me in the wall. A note in the wall? You ever put notes in the wall before? Yeah, a few years ago I put a note in the wall. She got a husband. I got a husband. Now the husband left me. I, got, I need another husband. <laughs> so, right? Uh, so he sent a sacrifice. And this guy, Bar Kamsa, he sabotaged the sacrifice. He made a cut in the lip. Now if he would have broken off a limb, the non-Jews would understand that's a, that's a blemish. Even for a non-Jewish sacrifice, that's a blemish, right? But a cut in the limb, in the, in the lip, they didn't consider that, that to be a blemish. And the rabbis got this sacrifice from the emperor with a cut in the limb. They knew that this guy, Bar Kamsa, did it. They knew he did it. It was a big debate what you do. Maybe we should bring it anyway. It's, it's, it's dangerous. You know, the king will be angry at us. 
There was one guy who was a little bit overpious. The rabbi said his overpiety caused the temple to be destroyed. He should have been more lenient, right? Everything they wanted to do, he vetoed, right? Maybe we should bring it anyway. So we shouldn't, the king shouldn't be angry. Well, they'll say anybody brings a sacrifice to the cut is okay. Maybe we should kill him. Our compensation shouldn't tell the emperor. They'll say whoever brings the sacrifice to the blemish gets killed, right? Anything they want to do. And the end of the story was they didn't bring the sacrifice. And Barakam should tell the emperor. And the siege on Jerusalem began. So my Rebbe asked the question, why did he say because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa? What do you want from Kamsa? Kamsa was the best friend that didn't get invited, right? What did he do wrong? It's not, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault, right, right? What did he do wrong, right? He should have said because of Bar Kamsa, the guy who made the party, doesn't even say his name, right, right, right? So the simple answer is, it means the mistake between Kamsa, because of the mistake of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, that's the simple answer, right? But on a deeper level, you know, we have a commandment in the Torah, Hochiyach tochiyach samisecha. You have to rebuke your fellow man. If you see somebody breaking the Torah, you have to tell him in a nice way. Don't say, you know, don't throw rocks at everything. <laughs> Imagine the car comes to the Meir Sharim on Shabbat and gets a rock right through the windshield. The guy gets up, you know, the right, shouldn't be driving on Shabbat, right? Where's the closest yeshiva? <laughs> that doesn't happen too often, right? Right? You have to talk nicely, right? Jack of Polinsky says he saw a guy getting into his car on Shabbos, right? In Tel Aviv, right? <laughs> if it's a Tel Aviv on Shabbos, right? right? Yeah. It's full, you know, the car's driving normally there, right? My first Shabbos in Israel was in Tel Aviv, too. The story goes about this Jew from America came to Israel, and the first Shabbos he was in Tel Aviv, and he saw all the cars driving. So he wanted to say something positive. What can he say positive? He said, what a wonderful place Israel is. Even the Goyim are Jewish. <laughs> Even the Goyim are Jewish. <laughs> Even the policemen are Jewish. Anyway. He tells the guy, Shabbos, what are you getting your car for? The guy says, You know what that means? What's it your business? He says, The Gemara asked your question. What? The Gemara, yeah, the Gemara says we're in a boat. The guy takes out a drill, says, Drill holders, what are you doing? <laughs> What's it your business? My seat, I paid for it. But we're all in one boat. You drill a hole in your seat, we're all going to drown. <laughs> right, 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 right. We're all in one country. You, you break the Shabbos, we're all going to suffer. I think that was a nice way of putting it, right? That's in a, in a, in a, in a general, if someone's breaking the tar, but on a personal level. Someone hurt your feelings. Someone did something bad to you. So if you're able to forgive them, you should forgive them, right? If you feel you're not able to forgive them, you're supposed to confront them in a nice way. Don't say, you bum. A nice way. You know you hurt my feelings. We don't like to do that. Why don't we like to do that? Because it's a blow to my pride. I'm going to admit my feelings hurt. It's much easier to say, I'll never talk to him again. Talk about it behind his back. <laughs> but then you got an enemy for life, right? If you confront him nicely, he'll say, I apologize. It was a mistake. I misunderstood you. He'll make up, right? So when Kamsa was not invited to his best friend's party, what should he have done? He should have confronted him. He should have said, you know, I invited all my children's party. Why didn't you invite me? He said, I didn't invite you. Oh, the servant must have made a mistake. Go tell Bar- don't tell Barbara not to come. He would have avoided the whole, the whole issue, right? What did Kamsa probably do? That bum didn't invite me. I'll never talk to him again. <laughs> right, 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 right. Because of Kamsa. And Bar Kamsa was Jerusalem destroyed. So the first thing we've got to do during this period of time is to work on love your fellow man. Love for no reason. Right? If someone really, you can't stand them, right, right? You have to try to work on it, right? Another place, the rabbis say, the first temple, right? They ask, why was the land lost? Amma avda aretz. And they asked the wise men they didn't know. They asked the prophets they didn't know. Until Hashem revealed it. Al shalom. Torah see. The verse says, they left me, they forsake my Torah. And the Gemara asks, what does that mean? They didn't study Torah? Then Why didn't the wise men know? Why didn't the prophets? Everybody would know that. Of course they studied Torah, but... They didn't make the blessing on the Torah. You know, every morning there's three blessings we say on the Torah, right, right? right? They didn't make the blessing on the Torah. So the Bach and the Shulchan Aruch has a question. It seems to be a very minor sin, right? For that, you know, okay, <laughs> minor sin. <laughs> like the joke, the guy goes to the rabbi, rabbi, I have to, I want to do tshuva. I ate without making a bracha. Oy vey, why did you eat without making a bracha? Well, the food wasn't kosher. <laughs> why wasn't it kosher? It was not a kosher restaurant. Why are you going to a non-kosher restaurant? All the kosher restaurants were closed. Why? It was Yom Kippur. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This guy goes to, his, to the rabbi, I can't understand my father. On Shabbos, he eats in the living room and he smokes in the bathroom, right? And your kipper, I know on Tisha B'av, he smokes in the living room and eats in the bathroom, right? And your kipper eats and smokes in the bathroom. <laughs> I can't figure it out. Right? It seems to be a minor sin, not making a brach on the Torah. If he had such a terrible punishment in the destruction of the temple, millions would die, would die, were killed, right, right? So the Bach explains, when we study Torah in the land of Israel with the right intention, the Shem Shemayim, for the sake of heaven, we connected our Torah study with the giver of the Torah, the Almighty. And that brought the Shekhinah down. You know, we say in the after-blessing, after uh, eating fruits of Israel and the grain, we say, Eretz Chem the Torah, Rechava, wide land, Shin Chatala Vaseinu, you gave to our ancestors, Lecho Mipirya Lispo Mituva. To eat the fruits, to be satiated from the good. You know why God gave us the land of Israel? Jaffa oranges. <laughs> Mangoes. That's what it's all about. The fruits of the land. That's what it's all about. Tell me, right? By Moshe Rabbeinu. 
I said, why did the Gemara say, you know, Gemara has a sense of humor, humor. the Gemara says, why did Moshe want to go into the Israel? To eat the fruits of the land? Mangoes! <laughs> Chaff oranges! <laughs> the Gemara does have a sense of humor, by the way. You know, in the it talks about, uh, after you check your house for Pesach, for Chometz, right, if you see a chulda, chulda is a weasel, if you see a weasel running in the house, you're afraid you might have taken a crumb and you have to check it again, right, right? Then what's the question? The chi chulda the viahi? Was the weasel a prophetess? You know, you know the joke? One of the names of the prophetess was chulda. Chulda was a prophetess, right, right? Was the chulda a prophetess? <laughs> Right, so the word says, no, Moshe didn't want to do the mitzvahs that can only be done in Israel. The mitzvahs are, please, well, Truma, it's Meisah, Shemitah, right? But he had enough mitzvahs, right, right? Says the Bach, but eating the fruits of Israel is a very important thing. We talk about this to Bishma, right? Because when we study Torah with a proper intention, we connected the Torah with the giver of the Torah, we brought the presence of God into the land, and it permeated the land, and it went into the fruits. When you eat the fruits of Israel, you're eating Shekhinah, God's presence. But when they didn't make the brach on the Torah, meaning they didn't consider Torah study to be important, it was just another subject. We learned Talmud. Is the only take a subject Talmud. Talmud one, right, right, all right. They just wanted to know the halacha, which is not such a bad thing. But they know the halacha is really good, right? They wanted to show off how smart they were, right, right. So they the, disconnected. They disconnected, right, the Torah from the giver of the Torah, and that caused contamination and contaminated the fruits. So not breaking the Baruch on the Torah disconnected us from God and caused the Shekinah to, to leave. So we have to remember that. We have to work on that. It says there are 21 days from Shavuot Tammuz until Tisha B'Av, right? Three weeks, 21 days, right? Corresponds to the 21 days from Rosh Hashanah until Sukkot Torah. Actually, it's 22 days. You have 14 days from Rosh Hashanah until Sukkot. Sukkot is seven days. That's three weeks, right? Sukkot Torah is the 22nd day, right? Right, but we also have 22 days. We have Yudav, right? The 10th this year it comes out on Shabbos, so we have Yudav, right? And even every year, the 10th day, the day after Tishma, we half a day we don't do we don't do the things that are forbidden on Tishma because it's that was when the temple was burned. So it's really 22 days. In any case, what's the connection between these two things? I heard a very beautiful explanation. What happened on Shiva Sabatamas? Moshe broke the tablets, right? Significance of the Duchot, right? Right? We say in Shabbos, Yismach Moshe, Matnas Chelko, Shnei Luchos Avadim Harbiyot. So we talk about the giving of the Torah Shabbos morning, because when was the Torah given? On Shabbos, right? Friday night we talk about creation. Shabbos morning they were giving the Torah, right? But not the Luchos. The Luchos were only 40 days later, right? Luchos were not on Shabbos. Luchos were not at the giving of, at, at Sinai, right? right? So why do you mention the Luchos, right? Because the Luchos was a connection. Moshe held the first, the, the four, the Fachim on the bottom, and Hashem held the top. They connected us with Hashem. That's the connection. Our connection with Hashem was the Luchos. That symbolized the connection. And after the, he broke the Luchos, he said, build, he brought the second Luchos, he said, build the Mishkan. The Mishkan was a, a manifestation of God in this world. That's a connection. The, the, the point, the center point between heaven and earth is, is, a, is a Mishkan, right, right? So Moshe is up on the mountain, and Hashem told him they made the golden calf. Why did he go down and break the tablets? He should have broke the tablets up there, right? He said, there's no roof, there's no, there's no floor. How can he break the tablets? There's no roof in heaven. How's he going to break the floor to break it on? Anyway. Why did he come down with the tablets in there? And the answer is, God told him there's going to be a day to go down. Now, you could say, maybe, ain't, ain't a dome of shmi, Luria. When you see it, it's different than when hearing God, right? But not for Moshe. Moshe, expect Larry Meira. He saw prophecy in its full you know, focus. He saw everything, right, right? But he didn't tell them they were dancing. He thought they made an intellectual mistake. We'll take the Torah. We'll show them they're wrong. When he saw them dancing, they're happy to do an Avera, right, right? Happy this man is over already, right? They're happy to do an Avera. They were dancing. That's what he broke the Luchos. That he could not take. Right? And what happened in the end of the 40, at the sin of the, and then Tisha B'Av, Tisha B'Av was the sin of the spies. What was the spies? They were about to go into the land of Israel to do a mitzvah, right? And they're crying. They're crying. It's one thing to be happy to do an Avera. You're happy to do an Avera. You're happy to do a mitzvah too, right, right? But they're happy to do an Avera. And they're crying over the mitzvah, right, right, right? They're crying about going into Israel or about this. If we'll give their mishpachot, the, uh, they have to leave their, their, their wives, whatever it is. So what's the tikkun? How do we fix that up? How do we fix that up? Right, right? You know, the, the uh, Kutzka says a very sharp word. It says in the, in the Tochacha, by the rebuke, why are we having these terrible calamities? Tachas ha'she'e lo avadatas ha'shem olokecho v'simcho v'tob le'evah. Because you didn't serve Hashem, enjoy in good heart when you had everything good. So the simple meaning is, when you had everything good, you shouldn't have been happy, you weren't happy enough, right? But the Koska says, you didn't serve Hashem when you did things wrong, you did it with simcha tovleh, with a happy heart, right, right? When you do a sin, you gotta do it with a crack, you know, crack to the side, ah, right? And they write that up in heaven, right? This guy did the sin, he did it with a sigh. He said it, oi, right? Can't control myself, right, right? 
They, because they didn't serve God, when they didn't serve God, they did it with, shit, with joy, right, right, right? They're happy to do it in favor and they're crying. So our tikkun is Rosh Hashanah. What happens on Rosh Hashanah? We cry. The, the Arizal says someone who doesn't cry in Rosh Hashanah, something's wrong with his soul, with his shama, right, right, right? We cry in Rosh Hashanah, we cry in Yom Kippur, we're crying over our sins. That atones for crying of the, of the mitzvah, right? And then the end of the period is Simchas Torah. What do we do in Simchas Torah? We dance. We dance with the Torah. That comes for dancing with the golden calf. Right, right? We're happy to do a mitzvah. Those, that's the two things. Isn't that very nice? That's beautiful. Right? Now, because the spies, they cried when the spies, God says, you cried for no reason, I'll give you a good reason to cry. Right? That's why we have to be careful. I'm thinking about not to cry for the wrong reasons, right? We can cry because out of despair. No, we have to cry for the right reasons. Not because that's what caused it. And God says, you cry for no reason, I'll give you a good reason to cry. Forty years in the desert, the Jews, whenever they, uh, every, uh, every Tisha B'Av, they would go to sleep in their graves. The men between 20 and 60, and some wouldn't get up in the morning. How many every year? Well, divide 600,000 by 40, you get 15,000 every year, right, right? Last year, no one died. They thought they made a mistake. They tried, next night, next night, they saw the full moon. Two B'Av, it's a little minor holiday. They saw the full moon, they, saw, they realized the decree was over. Both of our temples were destroyed on the same day, on Tisha B'Av. Right? Uh, the Spanish expulsion was on Tisha B'Av, right? The Jews in Spain. What year was it? 1492. 1492. The Jews of Spain were on the top echelon of power. They had mansions and servants and high government positions, right? right? And Ferdinand and Isabella made a decree. Either you convert to Christianity or you leave Spain with two suitcases. They had to leave everything behind. And it is the greatest glory of the Jewish people, unparalleled in the annals of mankind. Close to two-thirds of the Jews of Spain got up and left. Close to two-thirds, right, right, right. Uh, you know, Columbus writes in a, in a diary, he couldn't leave Barcelona Harbor, full of boats taking Jews, right? Uh, there was a famous uh, rabbi, his name was um, Barbernell. He wrote a commentary on the Torah. And he was the finance minister for Fernandez as well. He financed the trip of Columbus, right? They said, you're a good Jew, you can go, you can stay. No, thanks, I'll go with my people too, right, right? Um, the remaining one-third were called Muranos. Muranos means pigs in, in, in Spanish, right? They, they outwardly converted, secretly kept Judaism. If they were caught doing anything Jewish, they would torture them on the rack until they confessed and they would burn them in the stake. Auto de fe. Did Ferdinand and Isabella plan that to be on Tisha B'Av specifically? I don't know. The Nazis did things on Jewish holidays on purpose. I don't know. But one thing I do know, the fact that it was on Tisha B'Av gave the Jews a tremendous strength because they saw meaning in their suffering. They saw that it's the hand of God. Right? When you suffer for no reason, it's very hard to take it. When you know there's a reason, you, you were a spy, you got caught. The torturing you, give information about your buddies. You know, they will catch your buddies, you can, can, they can take the torture because you know it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. Right, right, right. They saw it was God's hand. World War I broke out on Tisha B'Av when they assassinated the Archbishop, right? The Archduke of Serbia, I think it was. Protasia, I remember. And anyway, and we all know that World War II was a direct continuation of World War I. The situation between the wars led to World War II, right? Anybody know who coined the term Holocaust? Who coined the term Holocaust? Do you know? Yad Vashem, right? Shoah. Shoah, we find in Tanakh only for the wicked. Shoah through Shaim, the destruction of the wicked. We don't find that by Tzadikim, right? And Holocaust in English denotes the calamity, right? If there was an earthquake, a tsunami, a volcano, you call it a Holocaust, unrelated to anything else. Now, the Holocaust was unique in many ways. It also was not unique in many ways. Who was the first guy who had the idea of killing all the Jews? And he was going to do it in one day. What was his name? Come on, right, right. So Hitler was not the first one, right, 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 right. So there are those who prefer to call the Holocaust by a different name. Churban Europa means destruction of European Jewry. That puts it in its historical perspective, right? You have Kabbalah by Rishon, the first temple, second temple, it's right, European history, right? But all these events had to do with Tisha B'Av. You cry for no reason, right? So what are we crying about in Tisha B'Av, right? First of all, all the terrible calamities that happened to the Jews throughout history all the result of the fact that we don't have God's presence. We don't have a temple. The Crusades, the Inquisitions, the Holocaust, the Intifadas are all included. You know, when we're crying, someone asks, why don't we make special uh, kindness for, for the Holocaust? They actually have. There are some, right, right? But it's not necessary because it's included, right? When we cry about the Mishkan, we're crying, the Mikdash, we're crying about everything. All the horrible calamities happened to the Jew throughout Jewish history is all as a result of the fact that we don't have the Shekhinah because we lost the Shekhinah. We lost the temple. And today we have another reason to cry. We call it the spiritual holocaust, right? Assimilation, intermarriage. And I say, right, there's another reason to cry, which is not so hard to cry in Tisha B'Av, the neighbor of Rabbi Gamaliel. The Gemara says, they cry at night. 
Rabbi Gamliel had a neighbor, a one, one a young woman who lost a baby, and she was crying all night about her baby that was killed, that died. And Rabbi Galil would hear her cry, and he would also cry all night with her until his eye crashes fell out. That's how much he cried. So the question is, what does it have to do with Eicha? The rabbi, the Gemara brings out on the verse in Eicha, Bochot I mean, there was a personal tragedy. What do you with the base of say? She cried over her son. He was crying over the base of English. But it seems he was crying with her, right? Right. And the answer is, when you see calamities, you've got to know if there would be a Beis HaMikdash. If we would have a Hashem Shekhinah, these terrible things would not happen. The reason these things are happening is because of the fact that we're far away from Hashem, right? And I'm sure you all know the neighbor of Rabbi Gabriel. We all have know somebody who had a terrible calamity. I'm sure everybody knows, right? They come around collecting money. They give these color brochures telling the story of this person and that person. Right? It's difficult to read them. I have a friend who collects all these brochures, right? And he saves them up, and before Yom Kippur, he reads it, right? Very difficult. All right, right, right. We all know someone who's a neighbor of Rabbi Gamliel who had a terrible calamity, and they're crying over it, right? If that, Rabbi Gamliel understood, if such a thing can happen, that's because we don't have the Shechina, because we're far away from Hashem. When there's a personal mourning, when someone close dies, right? So it starts off intense, you know? In the secular world, when someone close dies, there's usually one of two reactions. One reaction is, take a trip to Bermuda. Don't think about death. It's too morbid, right? right? Secular people don't like to think about death. It's too morbid, right, 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 right? The other reaction is, I'll never forget them the rest of my life. I'll go down to my grave mourning for my dear father, mother, brother, sister. And the Torah says they're both wrong. When someone close dies, you've got to sit, shiva for a week, sit in the house, don't wear shoes, tear your garments, sit on the floor, and cry for that person. People come to comfort you. You have to deal with it. You don't have to run away from it. Then for another three weeks, they slow shim, you know, uh, shave and take haircuts. So, you know, there's the music, right? You don't go to weddings, right? For a parent, an entire year, no music, no weddings, no new clothes, right, 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 right? Someone asked me why for a parent is more than any other, any other relative. I think the answer is when a sibling dies, when a child dies, when a spouse dies, you automatically feel bad. But a parent, you know, it could be they were 99 years old, last 10 years in her nursing home, cost you a lot of money, a big pain. Someone could say, why should I feel bad? No one lives forever, right? People say that, right, right, right? But this parent brought you into this world. It wouldn't be for them, you wouldn't be here, right? They changed your diapers and they took you to school, they you to, bought you toys and took you to the doctor and bought you medicine, right? and even if they didn't, the fact they brought you in the world, that's also enough, right, right? You don't appreciate what your parents do for you until you have your own children. You say, my parents did all this for me, right, right, right? So an entire year, right? You have to mourn, right? So it starts off intense and it gets less and less. When it comes to the base of Mikdash, it's the other way around. It starts off less intense and it gets closer. We have the, 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 we have the three weeks, right? No music, no weddings, right? No haircuts, no shaving. Then we have the nine days for Ashkenazim. It's right about just a week of Shavu of Tisha. We don't... Um, we don't eat meat or wine except on Shabbat, and we don't take bathe for pleasure, right? Right? And then we have Tisha B'Av, we sit on the floor, you don't sit on the chair, and you don't smear, and you don't wash, you don't put your hands up to the knuckles, right? And we don't eat it, we don't drink, right, right? For one day, right, a year to remember. That's what keeps us going. The fact that we don't forget, the fact that we remember, that's what keeps us going in all generations. We don't get used to our situation, we have to know it's not normal. Uh, to someone to want to come close to Hashem, a Corbin is the closest you can come to, I'm giving my life to Hashem symbolically, all right? And feeling Hashem's presence in the base of Mikdash, it's not normal that we have a lot of the world without that. We're in Siberia, right? So we have to focus during this time, right, on the sins that caused the temple to be destroyed. Sin Aschina, we have to make up with our friends. You don't talk to somebody three days out of anger, it's considered an enemy, all right? My Rebbe went to the I'm Michael, all the kidnaps, don't sit on the floor, don't fast. But just talk to your friend you haven't spoken to for three days, right? And then Torah, we have to learn Torah. If we would study Torah the way we should, all these calamities wouldn't happen, right, right, right? We connect ourselves, say the brach on the Torah, connect ourselves to the Creator, right? And we're crying over the fact that all the terrible calamities happened to the Jews, including the, 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 the Intifada and the, the terrible terrorist attacks today, right? We're still in a precarious situation, Iran with a bomb, right, right, right? So we're crying for that, we're crying for the spiritual uh, Holocaust. The Jews that don't know they're Jews, they're so far away from Torah, right, 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 uh, right. And finally, we're crying over Rabbi, Rabbi Gibeliel's neighbor, right? You know Rabbi Gibeliel's neighbor, right? You know somebody who had a terrible tragedy, right? It happens all the time, right, right? Feel that would not have happened had we had a temple. And we ask Hashem 
and it says that someone who rejoices, who, who's, who mourns over the temple, will rebuild it. The, the, the Gemara and Makkah says also the story that the rabbis, after the destruction, were walking on the Temple Mount, and they saw a fox come out of the Holy of Holies. And so it says in the book of Echa, Shualim Holchimba. And they were all crying, except Rabbi Akiva. He was laughing, saying, Why are you laughing? Why are you crying? What do you mean? We see the fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, it says, That's the prophecy that says, the negative prophecy. There's also a positive prophecy that, that will come back to Israel, will come back and rebuild it, right? Once I see the fulfillment of the negative prophecy, and I know there'll be the fulfillment of the, of the positive prophecy. That the day will come when, when, when children will play in the streets of Jerusalem. We see that. Old people will sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Oh, Yisham, there'll be weddings in Jerusalem. We see that happening today, right? So those who take the effort to cry over the destruction of the temple, of the redemption, they will merit to be happy in the Mithiyah. Zolcha doesn't say the will of Yiska. It says Zolcha right now. They'll be Zolcha to be happy, happy with the rebuilding of the base of Mithiyah. So we know that that's what keeps us going. The fact that we cry over the temple, that's what keeps us going. And if we're able to remember for 2,000 years, we'll rebuild the temple and, we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll live forever. The Jewish people will last forever. That's what Napoleon says. Any questions? Comments? Arguments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.